tonight have a full agenda and limited time, but we do have several guests today. So I thought again, if you all don't mind, um, we will do introductions, um, particularly for our guests. And so we do ask that you actually um, lift your microphone and speak into it so that we can have a, a proper recording and hear you um, between masks and plexiglass and all the things we deal with these days. So um, we'll just have you start here at the front. Uh, Sean Henry from the Nashville Predators. Sarah Finley. Vonda McDaniel with the Central Labor Council. Courtney Johnston, Metro Council, District 26. Jennifer Gamble, Metro Council, District 3. Sandra Sepulveda, Metro Council, District 30. Edward Henley, Pillars Development. Audra Ladd, Mayor's Office, Economic and Community Development. Christopher Wood, Office of Minority and Women Business Assistant. Chris Cobb, representing Nashville's Independent Music Venues. Alan Valentine uh, with the Nashville Symphony, but I'm here representing the entire arts community. Benjamin Goldberg with Strategic Hospitality. Van Eiler with Nashville Zoo. Rick Schwartz with the Nashville Zoo. Kia Jarman, NEPR Agency, representing the Equity Alliance. Ralph Schultz, Nashville Area Chamber of Commerce. Stephanie Coleman, Nashville Area Chamber of Commerce. Thank you all for being here today. We are gonna start um, uh, for our committee members, you know that we have been working with Equity Alliance and we did hear a preliminary report on some of their findings, um, predominantly within the um, individuals and, and looking at the neighborhoods and zip codes hardest hit by COVID and what were their primary needs. But another piece of their work has been with small businesses. And so um, they have more information in that report. Um, I emailed it to you yesterday. You do have a hard copy, but they also had a focus group on Monday evening. And so really hot off the press is some additional information that Kia is gonna give us just a brief overview and leave more time for questions since you have the report in front of you. Thank you so much. Uh, again, Kia Jarman, NEPR agency. And in particular, I'm working on um, the Black and Latino Business Outreach for the Needs Assessment. And so, uh, as already mentioned, you have uh, a robust report in front of you, but a few things that uh, I wanna highlight, uh, in particular from Monday night, but also from the general conversations we've been having, the surveys that have been coming in, as well as those one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations. Um, one of the areas in particular that um, business owners wanna make sure of is that they receive uh, their fair share, of course, particularly as it relates to the percentage of census. So if we start there with the percentage of black and Latino individuals in the city, they really wanna see the money distributed based on that percentage. Um, we talked quite a bit, and I, I watched last week's uh, conversation, we talked quite a bit about pivoting um, and using that language, but the, the, the truth of the matter is that that is an entire new business when someone has to pivot. And so very often, small minority-owned businesses are not available to do such a pivot in a way, uh, in, in, in a general environment. And then we add in uh, a pandemic um, with new audiences and new technologies and new needs. And so that is very challenging. So I wanna highlight that in particular. Um, there is a real need for COVID specific ideation to implementation programming. And we're, we see a lot of partners around the city who do, uh, and I get most of their emails, um, it's not necessarily specific to COVID. And so people need to be walked you know, hand in hand, one, two, three, four, five, what is supposed to happen so that they can get their business in, on track. Um, I think you heard uh, last week from Angela from the Business Incubation Center, and that is something specifically that they do. But business owners need to understand that that's a, an available resource for them and that there's a pot of money or availability there for them to be able to use that for. Another piece of feedback has been making sure that the partners who receive whatever funding that's gonna be distributed for them to then be able to uh, apply for or receive, that they are culturally atoned, that they understand the needs of black and Latino businesses. 
In particular, when we do this um, kind of all call for small businesses, very often they're left out of those conversations or because they have already applied, many of them have applied and they continue to get turned down, it becomes um, very tiresome for them. So if there's someone who really understands how to speak to the black and Latino business needs at varying sizes, so we're talking about from solopreneurs, solo practitioners on up to $10 million, we really have to, and as a city, we, we haven't always done a great job of, of that, of really saying differentiating. Um, so the last piece has been around tier-based um, uh, tier based um, program allocation, if you will. So businesses being able to, if you're a, a one person and you have to do the same level of uh, paperwork and logistics as someone at $10 million, it is very taxing. And again, if you do it over and over and over again, um, then you, you run out of opportunities and the narrative then changes to see no black and Latino businesses ever apply, which we know is not the truth. So I'll leave it there and then allow you all to uh, ask questions based on the information that was shared. Thank you, I appreciate your time. Thank you, Kia, for your research. Uh, I have read through the report, it's very informative. Appreciate this information and the uh, comments from the business owners about their personal experience. What, uh, and the, where you talk about the pandemic has caused a revenue loss for a lot of these businesses, is there a specific percentage of loss that they're reporting or is it just like overall they're having to shut down and 100% and Yes, yeah, so my apologies, typically there are page numbers, um, but there's a page and it actually at the bottom says by the numbers. And so some of those businesses, I'm, I'm seeing 90% loss. I'm seeing, I'm seeing more than 50% losses for people when they look at um, kind of year to year or, or year over year. So um, as an example, if in June they were doing 100 some odd thousand, this year they're at half of that. And, and we had a really good number of um, kind of online businesses already. We had an even a larger number, or about half of that number, who were brick and mortar. So they're absolutely having to, based on the regulations within the city, having to close down and not being able to open up. Um, other parts of that loss is that they don't have safety equipment um, to be able to receive. Anybody in this room who's had to try to get PPE, um, that protective equipment, has been very difficult to get that. And in particular, there were a few folks who mentioned there's the safety of their staff and being very concerned with having to regulate or, or mandate um, being able to uh, uh, you know, enforce a mask in their particular business. So those have been reasons why they have been slow to open back up uh, in particular. Some have closed, many have tried to sustain um, their business. They're just not sure how long they can sustain. Uh, I think the percentage in there was um, maybe, let's see, majority of them, I think it's here, um, can stay open, what was my number? Oh, about 40% of businesses could operate at this current state for six months or less, and they'll start having to close at that point. And that's also not considering the flu is about to happen. Some of these businesses are about to go into slower months as well. So they're just not able to really anticipate as well as they could have in previous years. Kia, good to see you. Um, one of the questions I have, and I think I'll echo that the report was was very good, especially the comments from business owners. You talked a lot about the challenges that some business owners are facing in terms of staying open, but did you come across businesses on the other end of the spectrum that are that are actually trying to thrive or have had some success and then are facing now limiting factors for growth um, and would prefer um, if there were ways to find ways to, to further their opportunities, what are some of the things that are holding them back? Thank you for that question. So um, so I often had to share with, um, there were some business owners who would say, I don't wanna take the um, survey because I'll taint the results. And I say, no, we wanna also get the triumphs as well. So we don't just want this to be a report full of um, what has not been working well. There have been a few businesses, particularly in the legal field and in the technology, IT, telecommunications field, who have done um, exceptionally well. Uh, that makes sense, right? Because um, in particular for telecommunications, because no, now we're all in a very virtual environment and businesses are looking for ways to get revved up in, in that way. Um, so there have been some that have done really well um, and who are looking maybe for small pivots to be able to do better. Um, I believe the, um, the restaurant industry has the potential to continue to do well, but it's so uncertain in some instances for them to know when they can open, when they have to stay closed, and 
Um, and some of that is just comes down to communications and miscommunications. There's so many updates uh, frequently that that's been uh, a concern, but thank you for that question. Hmm. Okay, thanks for this report. Uh, a lot of great information in here. And the page under consistent themes, it seems if you know, when you move away from finance for a second, the real need is business support, technology, marketing, accounting, almost aligning resources to support the businesses. I know Ashley, you and I have talked a little bit over the past few weeks. Are there other services outside of this group that we can almost apply here to get that backbone behind all the support that's needed, the networking events? As you said, let's use these companies as subcontractors to larger companies. How do we solve the needs of this without, I mean, there's not a whole lot of money to distribute anyway. But have you tackled that at all, or is it something we can do to help there? Thank you for that question. In particular, the reason I put that theme uh, there was because I was hopeful that that question or something to that manner would come up. What I know is that Metro has quite a few resources, uh, Metro as the depart or as the city, but also you had several people last week who were partners in the city. What has happened for, you know, consistently for many, many, many years, uh, and I've been certified with the city and the state for many years, so I've seen this process, is that there, there is often not consistency or, or synergy within the relationship. So they, they certainly get together, but um, in terms of having a, a consistent program together or there being a funnel, so as an example, if you go to start at National Business Incubation Center and then do you graduate to go to um, Pathway to get financed and then do you go to the Entrepreneur Center, we don't have that. Um, the other piece is that we have um, other kind of legislative documents like the Equal Business Opportunity Work and, and the uh, Business Assistance Office. We already have those, place, those things in place. What people are needing in particular, because I think your point is accurate, that these are kind of consistent, biz just general business needs. So these are outside of the pandemic. And then they're uh, uh, exacerbated, if you will, when the pandemic hits. What people absolutely need is someone to walk them step one, two, three, four, five. You know, if you don't have a B school degree, then you don't go through the same process. And so you're trying to figure out these things as you move along. And very often you are missing a step or two or 10. So they absolutely need someone who says, okay, this is step one and you're accountable for step one. This is step two and you're accountable to that. What I mentioned here were a few areas. One, how to pivot and, and, and how to implement that pivot. Because it's, it's not enough to just tell them in a training. We have tons of training in Nashville and, and abroad. It's really about, okay, now that you've done step one of what that pivot looks like, you've researched, you've got case studies, you've done these things. Now are you ready to actually pivot? Are there audience members who need your services, as an example? how to create and implement a business interruption plan. Many businesses just don't have the, upp the opportunity to understand what it means to have a business interruption plan, which is also necessary to do state business and, and, and government business. So that's important. Um, I have in here how to manage during a crisis, which can be different than a business interruption plan. So it's about looking at those, um, the most uh, terrible thing that can happen for your business, which you sometimes don't know, you don't know a pandemic's coming, but you know the most terrible thing is if you lose access to all of your customers. Well, then what is the next step that you take? So we got to go through that process. Financial prudence. I mean, the reality is we've got to make sure that people know what to do with the money when they get the money. So it's, and I imagine you all, of course, want to be good stewards of that. You don't want to just put it out there. So how do we help people understand? Some of that is, is um, historical. Some of that is generational. It's lots of reasons why people have challenges with finance, finances, but it is incumbent upon us to take this time and, and pause to do that. And then lastly, succession planning. This might have been the time for some folks to be able to step out, but they're in such a whirlwind, they can't figure out if they're going or coming. And so we have to also then uh, train them and give them uh, opportunities to learn. Is this now the time for you to sell your business? Is this the time for you to pass it on to the next generation? Or is this time to leave without causing too much interruption to your life? So I appreciate that question. My hope is that out of this, a recommendation that you all may consider is saying, how do we create a more comprehensive business, and I think I put it in here um, as a COVID hub, but that COVID hub then turns into a one-stop shop for where you find things. Really, I, I guess I would say a nonpartisan um, place. So it's not just government, it's not just um, one particular partner, but one place you go for everything. That is the true challenge as a business owner. Where do I get information that is accurate and for me? So I appreciate that question, thank you.
just to uh, piggyback off of what Kia said in this report, really um, uh, demonstrates and, and kind of, um, what do I wanna say? It, it, it goes in line with what we discussed previously last week when we had the agencies coming in, Pathway Lending, NBIC and the EC, talking about services they can provide. And at our last meeting, we discussed that the priority that seemed that maybe we should focus on is the better communication about business relief available, the one-on-one -on -one services, direct services to help businesses pivot, and also grants for micro businesses that were left out of the, of the PPP and EDIL uh, grant process. And if, so if we focus on that, and hopefully today, those agencies that were here last week did submit uh, proposals, and hopefully today we'll be able to kind of look at those and see how uh, we might partner with uh, organizations in the same way that we did with United Way and uh, Second Harvest Food Bank in, in relation to rent relief and food relief, how we might partner with um, agencies that are doing these work, doing this work in these three priority areas and how we might uh, uh, designate or allocate funding to support that and also direct businesses to that uh, remaining Tennessee business relief. I think the latest number is there's $83 million still left uh, within the Tennessee Department of Revenue business relief program that we can direct um, businesses to as well. So just wanted to make that point. Thank you for that. And I did, um, you all have a hard copy that I um, emailed out earlier. I will just add there is a fourth um, I didn't even have a chance to email it to y'all. It came in today um, with Conexion Americas, who um, does similar work with partners um, in the immigrant and um, Hispanic community. So we have those, um, and, and I think we do wanna get to those. If I may, um, if there are any questions, since um, so many folks came and had their um, their time you know, for us today, if there were any questions from the um, the proposals that you all have reviewed, um, I sent them out again, just so they were at your fingertips um, with any of our guests from um, either the Nashville Chamber, our Music Venue Alliance, rent Restaurant Industry, Nashville Zoo, or arts organizations. I, I, I just wanna, I just have a quick comment before we move on. Uh, in, in, your, in your report, you, you all stated that you needed a listing of all the businesses, and just so y'all are aware, um, I think one or two council meetings ago, uh, Councilwoman Stiles brought forth a resolution that established that, and it's now through the county clerk's office. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. I'll get more information about that because I, I know that there are many businesses who are not familiar with that, and we wanna make sure that they're not just having to be certified through Metro to be a part of that list. Thank you. I do have a question uh, for the Nashville uh, Business Chamber, and thank you all for coming here today and being available to, to answer any questions. Uh, we heard from the Nashville Business Coalition last week about um, some of the challenges and, uh, and barriers that their uh, members have, have endured, and, and it would be helpful, I think, to, to hear uh, from you all as well um, as we're looking at overall uh, support for our business community, just hearing uh, some of the issues or barriers that, that you all are hearing from your members. Thanks so much. So just to put that in context uh, before answering, we have about 1,600 uh, business members in Davidson County and about 93% of those fall under a small or medium-sized business category. And we have spent the last few months talking one-on-one -on -one with as many of those businesses as possible. So we've, we've gotten some pretty good feedback in addition to survey and, and research work on what those needs are. And we would say there are three top needs that we're hearing from our small business members. The first is capital and funding, and we've worked hard to make sure that they're aware of some of the resources that have been mentioned here already, uh, but we know there's a need for more. Um, that is a, a big barrier for small businesses right now. The second is counseling and guidance on how to navigate and adapt in this moment. 
and that could tie into uh, their own business plan. So we talked a bit earlier, Leah mentioned the need for pivoting a business plan. We've had an opportunity to have a few programs that really hone in on that specific need. We had Beth Chase with Incura and uh, Vanderbilt Executive Education both provide programming that get into some really um, tangible, tactical ways and tools for businesses to think about that. The third area is communication. So uh, there's, a, there's been a lot of frustration with just the, the um, amount of information and where to go for good information and where to go for the most up-to-date information. So we've worked really hard to make sure that we are connecting with Metro and connecting with the state on reopening plans, on where we are in those various phases, and putting that information out in a consolidated way, divided up by industry sector. We've also had the opportunity to have some of those industry leaders speak about their experiences. In fact, Benjamin uh, participated in, in our uh, program on restaurant reopening. Um, and that's been really helpful in just communicating to those, those uh, small businesses. So capital, counseling, and communications would be the top three. Let, could I just add to that, uh, that answer really quickly? We've also been working very much with other chambers, um, local chambers like the Donaldson Hermitage Chamber or the Black Chamber, Latina Chamber, uh, Conexion, et cetera. We have opened all of these opportunities up to non-members as well. So there have literally been tens of thousands, I mean literally tens of thousands of businesses in Nashville that have availed themselves of these opportunities for counseling and uh, for communication. So at the beginning of this pandemic, what we knew from our experiences with the flood and with previous recessions is that when small businesses in particularly in particular shut their operations for two weeks, 65% of them go out of business. In Nashville during the flood, we didn't experience a 65% loss, we experienced a 35% loss because of the access to professional counseling and guidance on things like marketing, on things like capital access, et cetera. So we've be really been focused on those small businesses in particular and giving them the information that they need to survive. And question about, about those resources. Um, in, in terms of the numbers of businesses that, that come to the chamber, uh, is there access to a website? Is it signing up for a program? Uh, what, what is the process mm. by which uh, organizations seek help? Great question. So the, the easiest way to find information is just coming to our homepage, and we quickly converted our homepage to go straight into COVID-19 and, and tornado resources as well. So if you go straight there, you'll see a list of all of our previous programming, which is all, all available to anyone, not just members. So any business that wants to look at that, that recorded programming, it's out there and available with presentations and slides and contact information. And then we've got all of our upcoming programming out there as well. You know, we worked uh, quickly to pivot all of our, our programming that was in person to a virtual platform, and we've been able to really um, hone in on that with, uh, I think we had about 4,000 uh, businesses participate between March and June in some of those webinar programmings. We had about 100,000 visits during that time frame to our, our webpage. So businesses just looking for that helpful resource and information. And then we had about 30,000 businesses reach just through our email communication, making sure we're getting out the latest information about uh, reopening guides and mandates and so forth. Again, I'd just like to add the, the thought that as we looked at this circumstance, we knew, we know again from our experience that recovery for individuals is difficult if they don't have a job and jobs are created by businesses. And so the target here has been to restore the economy as quickly as possible so that people have jobs and they can, they can recover. There are about 300,000 small business related jobs in this, in this area. And 56% of those businesses in that category eliminated jobs at the beginning of COVID. So the real target is how do we get those 56, that 56% 56 back so that people can begin to experience recovery uh, that we see coming in the future? 
I wanted to ask uh, or give each group an opportunity to sort of explain. Everyone here um, is asking for a, a different amount of money for different needs. And while I think sometimes the perception was that we have $121 million to go around, that's not true. And so we have to make the best of each of these dollars that go out and really down to the penny to make sure that they, that they are as significant um, in, in, in helping keep these doors open as possible. And so one of the things I'm concerned about is how viable is the business to begin with? And I know we've got lots of um, resources that people are needing. They, they may or may not have needed that before COVID, but they certainly need that now. And so what I wanna ask each of these groups is what have you done as a business to um, either raise additional funding um, you know, how much have you reduced your expenses? How have you done that? Um, just to show what, you know, how, what, how, what kind of business savvy are we? You know, what are we dealing with um, right now? Because there's a ton of need. There's not a lot of dollars. We really have to be careful. Well, I'll go ahead and, and lead off from a chamber perspective. With 80% of our membership being small business, a lot of those members were unable to pay their, their membership. So uh, in essence, um, in the last quarter of the year, we had to make a $1.2 million adjustment in our, in our budget. We maintained our staff capacity for that time because the need was so great. But as we moved into a new fiscal year, we had to vacate six positions within our staff um, in order to um, balance our budget for the coming year. So as we are pursuing funding from various sources, some of them private in business, some of them public with the state and with, uh, with Metro, we are seeking to restore some of that capacity that we were utilizing over that, uh, that that four months. So the answer is yes, we are pursuing other, uh, other revenue opportunities, but we have had to reduce our budget and our staffing levels. We didn't qualify as an organization. We were not a qualified applicant for PPP funds. So fundamentally as a small business, um, we didn't have access to those resources and we've, we've had to try to recover those resources elsewhere. I'd like to address the questions. Thank you, Council Member uh, Johnson, for those questions for for independent music venues. And and while I'm representing the swath of us here today, I'm gonna I'm gonna speak specifically for Exit In, which is mine, just because I have the best knowledge about that. And um, so I'll, I'll speak from that perspective on those questions. Um, I thought this was going to be a bad situation from the minute it hit um, for live music, um, being in that field for 20 years now. Uh, the, the core of what we do is, is we pack people together in a small space for a long period of time, and they project too. Um, so it was no surprise to me that this was going to be bad. So the first thing we did is go into, into cost-cutting measures immediately. Um, I laid off uh, 47 people out of 53 uh, in the third week of March. Um, if you look at um, the letter that, that we brought into that I brought in today, um, you'll see that the rest of us had to be right in there. We've laid off 90%, 89.5% of our staff collectively. So the first cost cutting measure that we could possibly find. Um, furthermore, every contract that we could possibly get out of uh, dishwashers, marketing, whatever it was, and we had a lot of vendors who were helpful with that. So we've done everything, but our businesses are closed. My business is closed. It is not possible to operate it right now because everything that allows it to operate is is gone. Um, there's two people left on staff um, and me. So there's three of us down from 53. Um, additionally, uh, once we did that, once once we got down to the bare minimum, we said, let's try to raise some money. Let's try to raise some funding. And so we, we did a GoFundMe. Um, many other independent venues ran GoFundMes quickly as well. And it, it was great. Um, we raised $15,000 in a few weeks. Exit in did. And we gave it all to our staff that we had laid off, 100% of it. Um, because while we thought it was gonna be bad, we certainly didn't think we'd be looking at 
2022 before recovery um, per this morning's chamber report for our specific segment of the hospitality industry. Uh, we had no concept at that time that we might be looking at 12, 18, 24 months potentially. So, and we're small business owners, so we wanted to help our people. Um, so we raised some money and most of us gave all of it or a very high percentage of it away. And we exhausted that base, our fans, our customers, our regulars who said, yeah, we wanna help you. We drained them real fast, um, unfortunately. Um, past that, uh, everyone here received PPP. Everyone received state funds. The unfortunate situation is that it is a, it is a Band-Aid on a gaping wound. Um, everything that is available to us, we have taken full advantage of, um, but it has run out already. It, those funds are gone. Um, an average of 14 weeks is what the combination of those funds provided for music venues, and we've been closed 100% or 98% if you count the two weeks that some of us could open um, for five months now. So, you know, back to how quickly does it take a small business to go down, we're way past that, even exhausting the revenue that's been available to us through the programs that have existed previously. Um, so just to, to, to try to answer that question, um, and, and many small business owners, most small business owners, I think, a lot are very savvy and have done everything they could do. Um, unfortunately, for some specific segments, especially in hospitality, there's not a pivot option. There's not a pivot option that is going to be able to close the gap when you're down 90%. I'm down 96%. And the two people I have left on staff have worked tirelessly. They'll tell you they're working harder now than they did when we were open, which I think you'll hear from a lot of the business community, which is mind boggling. I'm in that boat. I'm working, this is my full-time job now, is to try to keep us afloat. Um, we raised our merchandise sales by 300%. We have had successful streams, quote unquote. We have done the only pivots available to live music. That is, we, we have been able to, we have been able to generate $13,000 total at Exit M in five months off of all those full-time efforts of two full-time employees. Um, still putting us down 90 plus percent in our revenue. It cost me $20,000 a month to sit there closed with everything out, with everything that we could have exhausted, it still cost me $20,000 a month. So over five months, I've been able to raise less than 15. Um, it's just, there's no pivot and we've exhausted everything we can and we've responsibly bring our, brought our cost down and we're still, as you'll see in this letter, 13 weeks from now, um, 14 of the 15 music venues here will be 100% out of cash. 14 of the 15 independent music venues in Nashville, Tennessee, foundation level for the entire live music industry are gonna close before November 15th if we don't find a good amount of money before then. Thanks, let's keep going. I think I'll um, jump in next because it's very connected to the two things you've already heard. Um, the arts community, I mean, for, for the arts community, this is an existential crisis. Um, I, I uh, brought some data with me just to give you a sense of this and I'll, I'll answer the question, of course, in the process here, but, but we, we surveyed, a group of us surveyed just uh, the top uh, sort of nine arts organizations just to give you a sense of the flavor because I think the smaller organizations are the ones that are actually more, even more in crisis and jeopardy in this, but this will give you an order of magnitude kind of sense. Uh, the, the nine organizations, arts, nonprofit arts organizations in our community um, uh, have, since the pandemic began in March through the end of July, lost $44 million of revenue. Uh, the, um, uh, the impact of that is that those institutions generate about $10 million of local government revenue every year, and they have laid off 369 people, full-time, those are full-time jobs, not part-time jobs. There are hundreds of other part-time jobs that are also gone. Um, so uh, th that is a, a really huge problem for us. We recognize that the um, amount of money that was requested isn't gonna fix that problem. Uh, and, and that there isn't enough money even, you know, 
available to fix that problem, but helping these institutions survive this immediate crisis so that they can reemploy those people is important, I think, to our community. And it's important really just from the point of view of a business perspective. And, you know, live music, uh, creativity, those are our brands as a city. That's what our entire tourism industry is built on. And we're going to have to be able to rebuild that industry when this is over. So uh, um, the, uh, every one of these arts institutions uh, has been really creative and pivoted. You know, um, we've heard that word uh, plenty today. Um, and we, you know, in the case of just, for example, the symphony, we've produced a lot of online content, including educational online content that's available to parents and teachers. Uh, through the through the crisis as they've been homeschooling kids. We're, we're teaching kids music online using virtual tools. Uh, we're doing all kinds of things. The, the museums are doing a lot of online content. And um, uh, so the arts community has been really creative, but without the earned revenue, because we, like the independent venues, are in the business of bringing large groups of people together for an extended period of time, which we cannot do. Um, and so uh, at this moment, every bit of our earned revenue, 100% of it essentially has dried up. Um, and so without that earned revenue, we're unable to support the payroll. So um, these institutions have taken you know, bold action, uh, closed their doors, um, laid off their staffs. We, we accessed, uh, as the independent venues did, the PPP program. We all use that to keep people employed for a period of time. Uh, a lot of us are doing things like still providing health insurance coverage to our employees that were furloughed. Um, you know, of course, hoping that we can re-employ them when this is over. But to do that, we've got to raise money from the private sector. And in the case of the arts groups, the private sector cannot possibly make up that gap. Because for many of us, that gap is, uh, is two-thirds or, you know, an even higher percentage in the case of the Hall of Fame of our um, total revenue picture, and to make that up with the private sector and contributions is just not, not absolutely not possible. Thank you. So. Benjamin, <clears throat> you want to start the back row? Sure. So I just want to clarify, I'm <clears throat> in the restaurant business. I flip burgers and make fries for a living. Um, but I'm actually not here representing the restaurant business, per se, in terms of how you can help us survive for another two weeks with whatever money is available. I'm here um, because I'm shouting for the mountaintops that I think the end all be all to this is testing, 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 <laughs> and testing. And I think I can partner with the city to do that. But to answer the question, what have we done? Um, you know, we are, I work uh, every single day of my life in nine restaurants. Uh, we let 350 people that we work with every single day go. Uh, March 17th or 18th. Um, we have pieced together uh, the ability to open up most of our restaurants, um, and we will sell you anything legal you want. <laughs> you want a chair? I got gotcha. you. Uh, you want a restaurant? I got gotcha. you. Um, I think that what we are trying to do is find a way to, su to sustain as long as we possibly can, knowing the circumstances that we now, that we now know. I think the reality is very few people in this room thought that schools would not be open. And here we are. I don't foresee how a fund of $121 billion will allow us to survive without fundamentally changing the landscape in which we're doing things right now. And so while I know the restaurants and I can assure you I have done everything I possibly can to have a business at the end of this, my ask of you will come when you ask me questions of what I think we can do. I think we can partner with you knowing the people that work in restaurants, eat in restaurants, and play in restaurants. I think we can help with the proper support and funding, hopefully draw this to a close sooner so that everybody else in the room can come back to some normalcy without having to come back to government for more support. So that is ultimately why I'm here, I promise you. I can go into whatever specifics you guys want or need in terms of whatever cost-saving measures that we've done, but I promise you, there isn't one we have not done. The zoo is um, somewhat of a unique business in, in that when everyone started closing down, and, and you know, of course we were advised to close down as well, 
we certainly got rid of all, um, I, always, I hate to say non-essential employees because we felt that they were essential, but the truth of the matter is for the Nashville Zoo with over 3,000 animals, we could not get rid of those employees. And when a lot of people you know, would close their businesses and you turn off the lights to try to reduce the cost, none of that changed for us. So we initially furloughed 100 employees and basically just maintained uh, the animal staff to, to maintain the animals. But you know, our costs don't go down, utility cost doesn't go down, the food cost doesn't go down for caring for these animals. So we went extensive uh, cost saving measures for our food, our restaurants, you know, um, well, we've reduced that staff by 90, uh, 90 people. Uh, after the uh, PPP, which we were fortunate enough to get and that got us through, we still I had to lay off 45 people. So, you know, we have no education programs. We have no special events, obviously, because of COVID. So even though now we are, in fact, open and under the guidelines of phase two at 50 percent capacity, we are at about 28 percent capacity coming in. And of that 28%, the vast majority of that is members, which is certainly great, but is not is not revenue generating, right? So, that's uh, that's basically where we're at. Um, our our costs simply don't go down uh, because of maintaining the animals. There's a lot of zoos in the country. Um, well, all of the zoos in the country, quite honestly, just like the restaurant business, just like everyone here, is certainly struggling with with the lack of revenue. So, for extreme cost saving. Uh, measures for the zoos are to displace animals. And the truth of the matter is nobody wants your animals, right? Because we don't want to take on any expense. So across the country, you know, zoos have stopped um, breeding animals. Uh, so they don't have that extra cost and nobody's going to, you know, want to take those uh, animals in. Trying to reduce costs as much as you can. The bottom line is for a zoo, you can reach point B and you will never get below that cost, you know? So without, just like everyone else, without revenue, um, the zoo just cannot sustain itself. And I don't know of any business, you know, at 50% capacity, it, it just isn't sustainable. But um, the zoo's in a particularly difficult position because those costs just don't stop. Um, I hate to say this, but you know, we, we're looking at veterinary procedures. We've reduced veterinary procedures and just monitoring because some, some, sometimes Medicines can be very expensive and you have to evaluate, you know, what, what do we want to certainly put that funds into and what we don't. So those are, th so those are certainly things that I never thought uh, that I would ever say because animal welfare is our highest priority. But at some point, you know, we, we start to, to manage that. So um, just like you, we, you know, we've done every possible thing we, that we can uh, to reduce costs, you know, laying, laying staff off and uh, maintenance projects are, are going undone and you know, of course it's an emergency and you know, we do that in, in house of course but that's just the position we're in i mean we can only get to some uh, low costs and then that that's all we can do so without revenue um the zoo just can't sustain itself great thank you john jennifer just a, an overriding maybe two or three questions for everybody i think it'll all come back to the same First is, of the request you made, how long will that allow you to keep the wolf at the door, if you will, waiting for that you know, uh, recovery to happen, first. Second is, what are the resources are available, whether it be increasing you know, your, your loan caps, uh, more state aid, different federal aid, what else can help fill that bucket? And what else is still available that you haven't touched or that we can help? And then last, something that Benjamin said that I think is the key to everything, it is, testing, 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 regardless of what industry we're all in, if we're about bringing people together and every business is about bringing people together, how would testing, if we could solve that on the rapid, on the cost of it, and how we translate that to your staff first and then your customers, uh, guests second, how does that affect your business? Because I do think that is the key for every business in our county. Sorry. And I am gonna ask if everybody will keep their responses really short so that we stay on time. Um, we, we probably need to move on to some of the other discussion around one, so that's literally less than two minutes for each of you, if you may. We can go to one. Okay. <laughs> no, just because you're gonna start. <laughs> Testing. There Testing. We go. See you, Ben. Um, what other resources are available? Is that the main, the, the main question? 
Well, how long what you requested will last, yep. and then what else is available, because if what's yep. requested gets you to X date, yep. but there's no second wave. Yep, thank you. Um, six and a half months, uh, 1.5 million, uh, 15 venues, six and a half months is, is where that gets us. So I think, and we, that, that when we started working on this, the, the number was two and a half million. I've watched every single one of these meetings. I've listened to you guys. I've heard, I've, I've, I've deducted PPP. I've deducted um, the state grant. Um, we've made sure that we're not asking for money in 2021 because we understood that this, is, this money isn't available for 2021. So we have whittled this thing down to the bare minimum um, from every which way. Uh, but on average, that would get, that would on average one and a half million dollars would get these businesses six and a half months on average. As far as other availability, we, we all know the state has a lot of money. Um, I, I, this is my full-time job now, as I mentioned, uh, the bandwidth, small business owner, every, all these other things that have been talked about, navigating the complexity of the state. I'm sure some of you in here know way more about that than I do. Um, it has seemed very infeasible for us right now. Not that we're not trying. Um, it's Music City. We thought that we should start with the city for live music. Uh, was there a testing question? Just if, uh, when you look at the request that, that the restaurant group has put in, it's about testing. If we can develop the rapid testing, put them in play, how fast would that allow that? Well, six live, and a half months become four months or 12 months? Live music can't come back until we're through the pandemic. Uh, you know, that we're, that we're that tiny segment of the hospitality industry that we just can't come back. So we have to have a vaccine or testing, the rapid testing. We put you all on public hearing. They get two minutes for a public hearing. <laughs> <laughs> that way I don't have to interrupt you. The bell will. <laughs> well, for, for the arts community, I mean, the request that was submitted would really help the arts community navigate this in a reduced sort of state of hibernation. The music venues obviously are closed, T-Pack, Um We're, you know, just in terms of the symphony, I mean, we're gonna try to operate on a $6 million budget instead of a $28 million budget for the year. I mean, that's how radically we have cut our operations. And um, uh, we believe that if we, it, that the grant were funded, at the level that was submitted, it would help the arts institution get to next spring or summer. So it's a, it's a few months, but it's an important few months because if we can develop a vaccine, and I'm in favor of the very the idea of rapid testing. I mean, if we that would help our arts community as well, uh, because the more we can do, amp down caseload. The research we're doing tells us that our audiences for arts organizations are basically saying, we're not coming back until there's either universally available vaccine or the caseload count dropped to near zero. So testing would help get the case load, uh, case counts down and help us control the, the pandemic. Um, as far as reopening though, I would agree that you know, music venues really aren't gonna be able to do that until uh, we, we have a universally available vaccine and we're on the other side of the pandemic. But, but in the meantime, um, helping the institutions with you know, all of the creativity, all of the cuts that they've applied, all of the, the sort of innovative ideas around how to, how to you know, keep uh, in front of audiences, I think that the request that was made would really help us do that. It won't replace the jobs right away, but it will make sure that we're there on the other side of this to re-employ those people. And in the meantime, we're really struggling, all of us, with the question of talent drain. You know, not that we're gonna lose, for instance, musicians to other communities, to right. other orchestras, mm -hmm. in the case of the symphony, but we may lose musicians to the idea that I just can't afford to be a musician anymore. I mean, I already know That's we've been doing that, so. Thanks. Thanks. Um, I think for the answer for uh, how long will it survive, I think that I'm here just to kick off a conversation on how to get a bucket of money that allows us to be done in a way that I think will help the city progress forward faster. I see it because of what I do on an extremely granular level. 
you all, because of what you're doing, are seeing on a very broad level. I trust your decision on what you think is adequate. But what I will tell you at a granular level is, I don't see us getting out of this unless we take an active, a proactive approach to this, and not a reactive approach to this. The number of cases in this city have gone down. That is 100% true. I saw the mayor's announcement today that testing has gone down 41%. So is the virus down or are we just not testing anymore? Well, why are we not testing anymore? Because quite frankly, I think in the beginning, it was a really clumsy, clunky process through no one person's fault whatsoever. And we've lost the trust of the people in my industry. You go to a parking lot and sit for six hours to get a test and then 12 days for results, I'm not going back. But if we can systemically roll out something that is safe, effective, quality, and people believe in, we can get to the finish line of this faster. I can go and I have gone every single person possible. I've personally spent $25,000 testing our staff. I can't do that across an entire city. We can, though, make a difference in this, and I think it gets everyone else into a better place faster. So. Um, I think that the other side of it is, I'm not necessarily looking at this as a grant. I'm looking at this as an investment in the city. This is a very rare situation for the US. It's not that rare in Asia. They dealt with SARS. If you statistically look at what happened there, the cities that were deemed to be safe, businesses that were deemed to be safe, and communities that deemed were, were deemed to be safe, came back online faster in a better way than any of the other, other communities. We have an opportunity to do that we just need commitment from people to do so. It's a bit, a bit of a difficult question to answer, right? Because um, for us, you know, financially, it's a matter of, you know, which phase are we in? If we stay in phase two, you're at, you're at this amount. If you move into phase three, right? So I, I totally agree with this. The faster we get online, the faster all of us um, recover. For our, our case, um, you know, last year our attendance was a million uh, two sixty-six, and this year, you know, it's going to be just over three hundred thousand. So we're doing very conservative estimates for next year. The funding that we've requested would carry us a year um, with our um, portfolio that we've typically done with the city. So we would we would take our dollars and use that as matching dollars. We've had great success with that using these dollars and going into the community, into the private sector, saying it's a two, two for one. So we're looking to quite honestly double this investment to carry us much further. And that's been very successful for us in the past. Um, I wanna start by responding to the language around viability. You know, every, black and Latino businesses have always traditionally pivoted as much as they can, adapted as much as they can. And what they're looking and hoping for is that um, they're seen as viable and valuable. Um, because I, I can tell you lots of historical stories about what black businesses have looked like in this city um, and, and have been pushed out in a lot of ways. And so the request that they're asking is to be seen as, as viable and valuable. Um, based on um, what we've talked about today, I, I can make a healthy estimate that if about 40% of the businesses that I talked with are operating, you know, can operate this way for six months or so, the hope would be whatever um, they're able to receive could take them another six months to a year. Um, so especially, especially those micro businesses that we're talking about, those ones who are not eligible or who had very small eligibility for, um, for funding, PPP or EIDL funding. Um, and, and in particular, there are some things they can afford through that. The technologies, they can send their employees, uh, children to childcare. You know, to get back to work, you actually have to have childcare. I am right, my child is in school right now while I'm sitting here. So someone else has to educate him at that time. That takes a, a, a great deal um, of effort and work. Um, but also rental assistance, or uh, co these are commercial rent, you know, commercial mortgages, commercial taxes, and I know, understand taxes are not a part of that. Um, but utilities are continuing, regardless if you're open or not, bill, bills still continue. So the request, um, while I don't have a specific dollar amount, I'm asking that you all make some, um, s some real effort there in thinking about that amount. It is that, um, I, I like the word systemic, because systemically, there have always been um, an underrepresentation of black and Latino businesses, and you all have a real opportunity to be a game changer across the country relative to black and Latino business success. So I appreciate you, thank you. Okay, uh, three quick answers. 
Uh, number one, how long will the funding uh, sustain us? What total of our four proposals is a total value of $50,000. And what that does is provides us with capacity to deliver content uh, to a broad range of, of audience. So that'll sustain us, that'll give us that intensity through January of the coming year. Um, what other resources are available? We're making application all kinds of places to, to impact other, uh, other programming and so forth. But in this case, this programming is aimed primarily at small business, minority owned business and businesses that are on the margin, they can survive. Look, let's face it, and I, I heard the comments earlier, these businesses are gonna survive because of the initiative of their ownership. What we can do is give them ideas and support on how they can, uh, can undertake that survival. And then finally, with regards to testing, what I'm hearing from businesses, and we've, you, you see our financial projection or our, our forecast of recovery by Q3 of 21, what we're hearing from people is they're making plans to bridge that time, but the vaccine and vaccinations will be key to their final uh, execution on operation. I would never dispute the clinicians who say that testing and tracing is really key to maintain the flattened curve, but businesses are thinking in terms of vaccine and vaccinations being that dividing line for them in the future. Councilmember Spaldiba. Thank you, and, and thank you all for, for coming today and answering our questions. Um, I, I think we hear, um, we hear over and over again some uh, ideas and some solutions uh, that seem to be a common thread. I, I'm, I'm a little worried that um, I agree that we can't help everyone and that not everyone's gonna be able to um, receive some of the financial support. I, I, I'm a little worried that in many of these cases, it's, it's minority-owned businesses and women-owned businesses that seem to never make the threshold and be deemed unviable. So I, I just wanna make sure we get the language right uh, when we draft this resolution to make sure that we address this specifically because we are looking at potentially having three, four different entities that are going to be um, awarding this money and mentoring this, these businesses. Um, I know the last time we talked about maybe uh, including the independent music venues into that one resolution and not having a separate fund. Um, in thinking about it last night, I, I, I was thinking that when it, when it comes to these issues and awarding funding, Many of the times, um, anything dealing with arts always gets uh, left behind and we don't always address it. And sometimes they're not deemed viable enough. And so I wanna make sure that if we decide to have it within the same funding source, that we put specific language in there to address art specifically, because this is what Nashville is about and we all agree on that. Um, and so we, if we're gonna do a, a different funding source that does send a specific message, we have our, some of our peer cities that have done that, Memphis has done that. Um, I, I, I think I was listening at NPR the other day and Louisiana was thinking about doing that. Um, Nashville is Music City. So it, I, it's up to the body if we wanna have a separate funding source for that specifically, or if we wanna include specific language to make sure that we address that. Um, but I, 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 and my last point is, I'm still adamant about making sure that businesses who consistently did not follow uh, health orders by Metro are not awarded any funding. Thank you, good afternoon. This question, I hope doesn't take up too much time, but I did wanna find out, uh, does the new allocation from the state, uh, this $83 million, uh, does it help 
any of the musicians or artists because we did make an attempt to try to drill down a little bit further and help out businesses that were affected sometimes in a, a second level way. And so I don't, I don't want to belabor the, the meeting, but I just want to ask very quickly if that, if that does help musicians or artists, and just a simple yes or no would, would help. I, I don't know the answer to your question. I read um, that on Monday. Um, from the new groups that are the funding's available for. I did not see musicians or artists specifically mentioned. Mr. Valentine, maybe, that knows. Chris, did you say, though, that you did receive state funding in the first round? Oh, yes. 100% so of the music venues on what? the letter did receive state funding in the first round. The most anyone received was $2,500. The least anyone received was, uh, the most anyone received was $20,000, and the least anyone received was $2,500. So the, the venues were, were eligible the first time. Yes. Yep. And I asked that because I want to be able to, to, to go back and have conversations with my other group about music artists and other artists across the state, but specifically in Nashville, uh, because we do have a larger bucket of money at the state, and, and I don't want to have a situation where if you're not getting helped, and we think that we are helping, uh, that it doesn't, that the goal's you know, un unknown. So uh, that piece. Uh, secondly, and this may be a, a question for the group here, I'm hearing a lot of requests for money and, and I'm wondering this, uh, as we've talked about nonprofits, uh, the $150 million that they could apply for to help with COVID-related expenses, oftentimes we thought about uh, providing food for children who are out of school, providing ancillary services, but I'm wondering if we could have a conversation with a nonprofit to apply for a specific grant to address what you're bringing up. You know, what, what would it look like for a nonprofit in Nashville to apply for a grant to specifically help live music venues, to help artists, to help restaurants, to help small business, in addition to what we might do here, but also to complement that? Because if a nonprofit can apply for money to help provide lunches for children, if they can provide testing for people, then it makes sense to me that since your business has been affected by COVID-19, then a nonprofit could apply to that $150 million bucket uh, that will expand later on, but at least can apply that and, and include what you're asking for uh, on top of what may come out of this group's money. Address that. Um, I, we looked at that nonprofit fund at the state and realized that it really didn't make a lot of sense for the symphony because of, of the guidelines, the way they were written. And, um, and so, you know, while that non that fund might help us do things like when we are able to open, you know, obtain the PPP we need and all that stuff, um, you know, to take the precautions we have to take, there really wasn't any way to, to do anything with that fund that would actually help solve the problem of musicians, for example, not uh, uh, having incomes at this point. And so, you know, that, that was a challenge for us, but if, if there were a way to fix that somehow, that would be really um, helpful. And, and I'm trying to be creative uh, and think about not having you apply for it, but have a separate nonprofit apply for it to address what you're dealing with. You see, that way it, it's not the symphony trying to provide the money to the artist. It's a separate nonprofit. It's the Harold Love Foundation who realizes that artists and, and, and business have been affected and then applies to address those issues. And so that's why I'm trying to be a, a bit creative and think like that. Yeah, no, well, and you know, what, one of the things, you know, I think even, you know, help that isn't like restoring the full employment would be really good because it would help prevent talent drain. But the other point that hasn't been made is that not only is this our brand, music and creativity is our brand and the arts are important to that, but the arts also hold the key to helping our community recover from the emotional and psychological wreckage that this thing has wrought. Councilmember Johnson. So obviously, um, as far as what this committee is tasked with is in allocating money for relief for obviously different areas, the business, small business support is gonna be or is the most complicated one, because all diff businesses are different, all businesses have been affected differently, um, all businesses started off from one point, or you know, everything is completely different. And so we're tasked with 
first of all, we've got $33 million left to allocate. That's it. So how do we stretch those dollars and make sure that we are spending them in the correct way and that we're not, that we're doing it in an equitable way so that everyone has access? I think it's very important to me, and I've said this in other allocations, is that we have a very clear and concise messaging and direction. Go here. This is where you start. And from that point, we've, we create, this committee can create a pipeline to where these businesses go, and then from here we decide, this is what you need from here. You need technical stuff. You need you know, fiscal management. You need you know, these types of resources, because giving you money right now would not be, or maybe you do it in, you know, in conjunction, like you're saying, right? Because some people need to know what to do with the money before they actually have it. So everybody, we have to meet these businesses where they are, and everybody's in a different spot. Um, I do like the idea of allocating whatever amount of money that we're going to allocate toward small businesses is that it, to allocate out of that or sub-allocate, I don't know if that's a word, um, <laughs> for music venues and the arts and all of that because that is who we are. Um, and it's also the industry that has hit the hardest. And it has to come back. Otherwise, we've lost our soul. We've lost our identity. So I have said that I wanted to start prioritizing phase four businesses. Well, everybody's like, well, what's a phase four business? And it goes back and forth. In, I'm looking at it, and bars and entertainment venues are closed until phase four. And there are, and, and so, and gyms, not gyms, not gyms, not gyms, sports. I mean, I don't think the Titans aren't coming to us, so I think we're all right. So we're looking at arts and entertainment with the greatest, greatest need. Um, and so they are the ones that are hit, being hit the hardest. So we've got to figure out the way, how to prioritize um, because, um, and also we need to make it clear that we're not trying to make you whole. We can't make you whole. The goal is to, when we come out on the other side of this, to your point, and I think someone else said it too, is to have a business for people to go back to. So we're just trying to keep your doors open and we, we, we can't save everyone. Um, we don't wanna give too much, but we also don't wanna give too little. It makes no sense for me to give Chris over here $40,000. What does that do? That is a waste of $40,000 because in two months he's closed, that's it. So we have to look at it on what's a meaningful allocation to these people. So that's a lot of words just to say, this is a huge thing to wrap our, wrap our minds around and, and it's hugely important that we, that we get it right. And so this, um, I almost feel sorry for us <laughs> at this point. <laughs> To try to do to try to do this in 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 the right way. Um, my my concern about rapid testing is that I don't know how accurate rapid testing is. Um, and also, if I get tested right now and I test negative, I could go to dinner tonight or wherever and and, and contract it later on tonight. So it's almost an, a constant need that I don't know that the CARES Act money has the capacity to even touch what that need is. That's, that's my concern with that particular um, request. Um, I understand it's, that testing is necessary and important. I just wanna make sure that we're looking at what we have capacity to do. What, you know, what is our scope? Do we have more questions for the group specifically? question um, for, uh, for Chris. Um, I just sort of looked on the website for the uh, Music Venue Alliance and I noticed that it's, um, it's a nonprofit and I was wondering if you did apply for the $150 million type fund, uh, kind of going back um, 
with already the comments about sort of potential resources available. No, this is the first that I heard about that fund. This nonprofit organization was formed in April due to COVID. Um, sorry, the website looks so bad, but uh, it's, you know, uh, I'm the president of it. Um, so I'm not, I'm not really in the, the nonprofit world or the no, uh, we formed it just so that we could all come together and try to help each other figure out how to survive. But um, that's one of my handful of notes here <laughs> to, to, to research that and try to determine whether or not there's eligibility there. Thank you. Um, Council Member Gamble. Uh, I just want to uh, piggyback off of what uh, Councilwoman uh, Johnson said. There, we, we're dealing with $33 million left out of this CARES Act funding, and we haven't even touched um, school nurses, um, uh, child care, additional support for our emergency management offices for uh, our response. So, so when you're looking at 33 million, 33 million left, I mean, we, we're, we're dealing with pennies here. So we, there's just not enough funding to support all of the requests that we have. And although I really agree that music, arts, and hospitality uh, are a big part of what Nashville is, um, we also, you know, we, we just don't have enough funding to support all, support those industries or support the request for those industries. So I would just suggest that we look at how we can maximize uh, the most out of the support that we can provide. And if we're looking at uh, supporting or, or, or narrowing it down and supporting uh, agencies that are in the phase four uh, that have been closed and are still closed until phase four and those that have not or were left out or didn't qualify for other funding uh, that would kind of help narrow in on, on a group that uh, possibly the funds that we do have available can support. And then, as I said earlier, uh, partnering with organizations to help direct those other businesses to the funding through the state, whether it's the nonprofit funding, whether it's the Tennessee Business Relief Funding, uh, because there's just, there's just not enough funding locally uh, to go around. So I just want to remind everyone as we're, I know it last week we talked about including the Music uh, Venue Alliance and, and the Nashville Zoo in our business proposal. But again, I would suggest that we maybe focus more on partnering with those organizations that where these businesses can go to for their support as opposed to us trying to put in our resolution support for those different industries because there's just not enough funding to do that. Edward, so, did you? Yes, and, and this will end with the question. So for, and primarily Chris and, and, and Mr. Valentine, the best way I believe to allow any business to survive is to allow their business to do business. Um, and currently I wasn't part of developing the phase plan, but it sounds like because you're a phase four business, your hands are tied, although at the state level, I believe you would be able to operate. Um, you know, our, our committee is tasked with allocation of funds, but I continue to wear the hat that we should also be working to build, um, I think, trust and in, in a, in a better belief in this community's um, operations during this time. I think that's what we should be using the money for, whether it's rapid testing or whether it's increased safety uh, measures. I feel like what would really be helpful as we continue to go forward is for venues particularly artists themselves to craft something that says why you feel you don't need to be phase four right we are we're phase two and we know we have to do x y and z i've i've, <laughs> I've been around town i've seen house parties people are gathering and having live music whether you allow it or not um I, I went out to restaurants you sit across from somebody in a group of people and they they there for two or three hours so i feel like if you feel you're being restricted we don't want to throw money at a problem that we can't truly solve. But if you give us a commitment and an action plan that we can say, the city now needs to have more people who are health inspectors because you're going to be tested and you're going to be upheld to a higher standard. But if you can operate at 25% versus us trying to give you 10% of what you need, um, and we entrust our citizens and we give ourselves a, a pat on the back as well as a, a stern talking to about how serious it is that you manage the situation, I feel like that's how we'll navigate and how we'll come out on top. And I feel like 
you all have to bring that to us. We're not, we're not built to develop that. Um, but I think that will help a lot as we go through this group and be able to say, now that you've mentioned these things, we can allocate money. Do you all feel that that's something that, just respective of the people you speak for here today, are capable of doing? And have you seen something at a restaurant that has worked well that you feel like your staff could embrace and, and, and replicate? Well, um, for, first of all, we, we actually have developed all kinds of plans, and I'll speak on behalf of the symphony because that's what I know about, um, that have to do with, you know, how would we socially distance seating, do socially distance seating in the hall? How would, what kinds of precautions would we have to take to protect our staff, to protect the musicians? And by the way, you know, one of the problems with musicians is they, wind instrument players are blowing air through horns that are, you know, uh, sources and of course singers as well. So there, there are a lot of studies that we're working through right now to, to, to make those determinations, but we actually have plans already. The challenge is it's twofold. It's one is when will the city health department allow us to reopen, you know, phase four. Um, but the second challenge is the attitude of our patrons, of, of you know, just ticket buyers. I mean, we, we last year served 250,000 people who bought tickets to come to concerts down there. And what we're getting in the research we're doing, which we're doing with a national consultant and two other orchestras, is 75% of our audience is saying, we're not setting foot back in that place until there's a vaccine or until the case counts are near zero. So that's troubling to us because we can't make, somebody else said this earlier, I think Rick did, that we, we can't make it on 25% of capacity or 50% of capacity. We need to sell 80% of capacity. So that, that's the challenge. But, you know, it, but I, I do think that the idea of helping those organizations, like the Arts Commission, which could be very helpful to all of us, um, that will have an impact on our ability to reemerge. Kendra. Thanks. So I, I think that there's a lot of folks saying a lot of really smart things. I think part of it's the market and what makes you want to go back, whether it be zero case count, a vaccine, or whatever that looks like. I, I will say a couple of things about rapid testing, accuracy, and all of that. I agree with you. There might be a concern with that. I, I however, would argue that asymptomatic cases are a much larger concern. And unless we go after those, we will never solve the problem. And so I think that, and there are examples of this working. Um, I think the NHL, I think Ms. Trenner knows better than I, but I think they've had zero cases in their bubble. I think the NBA has had zero cases in their bubble. That's not because they reduced, that's not because they sprayed a magic potion and said the virus is not in this bubble. It's because they're testing every single day. I understand we don't have the resources in this room to do so, but we have the resources in this room to chip away at the problem. What if we got the restaurant industry as a whole to say our staff will be tested every month, 25% every month, 50%, 100. How do you, as opposed to looking at it from the bottom up, let's look at it from how do we create Nashville as a bubble? How do we make Nashville the safest city in the world? And if the answer to that is testing, which I believe it is, then let's put some resources behind it in a systemic way to help everyone else in this room. But I just wanted to make sure I point out, I agree with what you are saying, that maybe there is a slight inaccuracy in some of the testing. But I believe you're looking at a 40 to 60% asymptomatic rate. That is exponentially higher than a 90% accurate test. So that, and again, I'm not looking for anything for any one of my businesses. I'm looking, personally speaking, to get the city back on track as fast as we possibly can. Our employees are in the demographic that the city has a really hard time controlling right now. You are right, there are house parties going on. I see it all over the interwebs. How do we get our employees, your friends and everyone around tested systemically? This is a plan to do that, even if it's not this exact plan. That's all I'm saying. Okay, so we've got five minutes, um, and I, I do wanna try to keep us on time. I know a few folks said they had a hard stop, and I don't want our committee to have to leave and continue discussion without our members. Um, so we probably need to make our agenda for next week. Um, Council Member Spoldova, I didn't want to cut you off if there was something. I was just gonna say one last thing so I have peace of mind. Um, <laughs> I want you to have peace of yes. mind. Yes, 
Uh, I agree. Testing works. And uh, I'm hesitant to say, you know, people in phase four, why do you, why shouldn't you be in phase four? Um, coming from the council district that has had more cases than any other district, it, it's, it's really hard. Um, and, and we're just trying to get everything under control. And the more people uh, abide by healthcare orders, the faster we get done with this. Um, I also want to just reiterate that um, arts is always the first thing on the chopping block. And so I want to be hesitant when we, when we talk about this. And um, many of these, like the symphony, these venues, they're the first ones to close and they're going to be the last ones to open. So I just want to make sure that we have the proper language to address that. So let me ask this of the committee. Um, Last week, we did have um, individuals from NBIC, Entrepreneur Center, and Pathways um, in conversations the past week because there was a question last week also about um, immigrant and um, Hispanic. Um, Conexion has a similar um, business plan and service as NBIC. So you have, and I, ha I owe you that one electronically, but you have the hard copy. So I think we can spend some time talking about how can those organizations help facilitate what we've heard today and that we might get into more of a conversation about developing a resolution and the guidelines and amounts and what not next week. Does that sound accurate? I just want to make sure that when we, uh, what I was impressed with when we had uh, the incubation center and EC and pathways, and, you know, the um, and, and obviously Connexion as well. The level of um, camaraderie that they had mm -hmm. and teamwork already. So I felt like that sort of infrastructure was already there, which is really good because they each create or, or, or give a unique set of resources and services to different businesses, and so. To my point earlier of saying having a clear, concise message and pathway to these resources is to create that. I was, um, when I'm looking through, I just want you to be able to communicate this with them is that I, I'm hoping that we can have a cohesive sort of system that we create. I was just gonna ask, do we want them to come back so that as I would you like are for drafting them or I, thinking that I would, or at least answer questions on the spot? Yeah, at least to, to brainstorm. But so one of the things that I was a little bit concerned out about when I'm reading through is that they, where did it go? I think it was the Entrepreneur Center that, that said a, like a timetable was like six months. No, 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 no we've got businesses that are in six weeks going to be gone. Mm -hmm. So we've got to be able, we can't reinvent the wheel. I think so all everybody needs to understand that whatever they're asking for needs to be something that's just going to be able to amp up what they already have. We're not reinventing the wheel. We've got to be able to get these resources, whether it's training, you know, that and money mm -hmm. or money, whatever, as quickly as possible. But to start, like in my idea, when I was kind of going through this, Lay, laying awake at night is to start at the Entrepreneur Center. Entrepreneur Center comes in and says, okay, business A or organization A, these are your needs. You need to go here. You need to go here. And from there, branch off into this network. Some people are going to be ready for the money. They don't, they don't need marketing help. They don't need uh, pivot help. They don't need whatever. They, they just need money to keep their doors open. And so that would be a direct line to pathways as far as a money thing. So for them to kind of revise their mm -hmm. proposals that is something, because I don't want to give a million dollars just to infrastructure for right. being able to do this. Obviously, they're going to have to hire more people. There's going to be some technology needs. But let's let's think about this realistically on how we can get this done quickly. Um, so that's what I would like for you to communicate with them is Let's, let's see how we can all work together to create this pipeline so that we can clearly and concisely give this message that people can apply, like Exit In can go apply specifically. The zoo can go sp apply specifically. And that way, it is equitable because everyone is going to the same place, has the same set of resources, we'll figure out our application process, we'll figure out you know, who's eligible, but that everybody has the same pathway. That to me is the only way I can think of 
to, to make this as equitable as, as possible and for everyone to have the ability to communicate with the people because not everybody speaks English. So, you know, we need to have those capabilities as well. Does that make any sense? Okay. <laughs> yeah, um, just to sort of um, clarify what I think um, I'm hearing today is that r right now we don't really have the funds to make grants that are gonna move the needle for a lot of organizations. But what I heard from the Equity Alliance report is we need a COVID hub. What I heard from the chamber is they have a website that's geared toward businesses. What we heard from the Entrepreneur Center is they have a lot of infrastructure, consultants, advisors that can help, and they've given us a proposal to create some sort of information um, platform. What I've heard from Incubation Center is they have partners and ways of getting communication out to the people that they serve. What I've heard from Pathway Lending is they partner with all of these organizations. This is the time in a pandemic for everyone to collaborate and come up with a one size fits all, put aside your separate constituencies and create a comprehensive information platform for people to go to find out what are the resources, what are the possibilities, and even what are the, the healthcare advancements that can help with business, whether it be rapid testing or something else. Um, I think we really need to try to use what we have and refine it and share it rather than try to think about funding, people creating things. Mm -hmm. okay. I, and I also want us to remember to, to, in making this an equitable process that we're not having businesses, for example, a business that has revenue of 20 million competing with a business that has 100,000 a year revenue threshold. We need to make sure that we're uh, having tiers uh, as we're looking at the kinds of support that, that, we'll, be, that we'll be allocating. And, and I, I would suggest that maybe we can submit questions to the EC, MBIC, mm -hmm. and Pathways ahead of time of the next meeting because I really would like to see us Please do, yeah. re reintroduce a recommendation at the next meeting okay. in, in, in preparation mm -hmm. for the September 1st uh, council meeting. So if we can get those questions asked and answered prior to the next meeting, then our next meeting can really just focus on discussion and a recommendation. Great. I think one question is whether we want to include Conexion and the chamber in the discussions in addition to the three from last week. I'm seeing head nodding. Okay. All right. If there is oh, nothing else for Sorry, upcoming. can we get a quick update from the state just to see where we're at? <laughs> sorry, Representative. <laughs> we're going to make you go back to your seat. You got busted. No, I was almost gone. So I did want to let you know that I, I, I've had a conversation with the governor. We were talking about with the, the nonprofit amount, $150 million. And I did express to him uh, the difficulty in it being reimbursable only. I think we've gotten some traction with that uh, because we, we demonstrated the time frame, right? You're talking about even if you have a five-day window of a reimbursable grant, uh, what's it look like for Exit In to be waiting for uh, $10,000 back from the state, you know, if, if your nonprofit qualifies and you're trying to help other live music venues, right? Then you gotta wait another five days and another business is coming and saying, well, we're gonna close tomorrow if we don't get any money. So we're very close, I think, to getting to a place where we can have it just be a grant and, and trust that it'll be okay. Uh, so we're, we're, we're almost there with that piece. Uh, the second piece is that this $83 million we rolled out, again, tries to address the issue of businesses that were closed, but we didn't know that they were not gonna fit into that certain category. And again, all this is coming about because, again, as I said last time, that money we set aside waiting for approval from the federal government to replace revenue, uh, when that got canceled, we had to find ways, which is why we also rolled out a broadband uh, application because we realized if we're going to talk about kids and distance learning, we have some counties that kids just don't have access to broadband outside of the library at the school or outside of some business. And so that's where we are now in, in rolling those things out. And I think that the nonprofit $150 million uh, grant 
amount, it has not been fully expended. I think we'll see that just like with the small business award that we gave, not all that was expended, and so we're in the process of reevaluating all, re all that. Also knowing that this is August the 20th, and we have to start rolling out some large amounts of money very fast because we have to make sure that even with the testing piece, right, we have to get that testing done right. Um, even with PPEs going to our schools, we have to get those out, which all, every district does have PPEs for their teachers, but it's more than that. You know, it's about getting our businesses again protected and again catching these small businesses that we didn't think we're going to catch. The caterers, as you saw on, on the listing, you know, who, who didn't think that they were not in that list. And so these are the, the things we're doing right now. But I, I think it's, I do want to report to you that uh, we're making progress on the piece with the nonprofits because I told the governor, you're not going to have a nonprofit apply for a million dollars for the grant. They're going to be applying for $50,000, $85,000, $25,000. And it doesn't make sense for us to say, okay, if you apply for $25,000, uh, it's reimbursable. Well, when you spend the first 25, that's it. That's what you're spending. And, and you're hoping that you get that 25 and can then uh, come back and apply again. So but I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody has any specific questions. Audra? I, I have one question. Uh, first of all, thank you for everything you're doing at the state. There's 168 million that was released on Friday. 83 million was part of the small business, which flows to the Department of Revenue in a greater number of categories, which is good. There was also uh, 25 million in tourism dollars that were released, and I'm trying to figure out if there's any way for some of these businesses that are really tourist centric for some of that money to go there. Um, and so I, th I haven't gotten clarity from the state, so maybe that's something you could help with, because, I, I mean, that's a, you know, if, if it was $2 million to support m these independent music venues, it certainly feels like tourism and a symphony as well. So th that would just be my ask. And, and to that end, um, here's what I'm of the opinion also, that many of the departments and commissions that receive direct grants or direct monies originally probably haven't expended all that. Uh, you mentioned Arts Commission earlier. I think, from what I saw, the allocation should have been about $480,000, and it says specifically that they must address issues dealing with art, payroll, rent, art. And so uh, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna check with the Arts Commission to see if they've expended all of that money. If they haven't, you know, it's like any other department in, in the state or metro, nobody's waving their hand saying, you know, we have this money, but also even when they're waving their hand, who can see it, right? Who, who knows, who would have thought to call the Art Commission? Who knew the Art Commission would get money from the CARES Act? And so I'll also check on that to see if, and that's what I was gonna tell you, is I'm gonna check into that also for the live music venues because that fits into art also because it could be for payroll, which means you could hire some folks back, right, to, to prepare for. Of, of the return, and so I will check into that piece also. Yeah, Audra, I don't want to speak for the state. I'd love for Representative Love. Uh, uh, the tourism dollars allowed under the coronavirus relief fund are more around marketing, um, a safe reopening, and marketing um, when we are open, and um, it is not considered grant money, but we'll let those at the state make sure that it's spent in accordance if, if it's under CRF. Okay, yeah. we're pretty close to on time. 10 minutes <laughs> past is fairly on time for us. Um, so thank you, and just a tremendous thank you to our guests. Um, thank you for spending your time. Thank you for what you are doing for Nashville and trying desperately to keep Nashville, Nashville. Um, we appreciate you and, um, and, and your time and, and educating us today. Um, we are officially adjourned. I do still have a comment. I know we're officially adjourned, but I feel like, and, and these opinions may not be popular, but I feel like there are a couple things I heard today and I appreciate everyone for coming. But the public perception that we will hit zero cases and the public perception that until there's an effective vaccine, I think we do a disservice when we embrace that fully because we don't know, right? The reason we have the phases we have now, the reason that we only thought we would be in this during, through summer is because we were wrong. And I feel like doing that again and doubling down on it is dangerous. And I feel like if we do hit a point where we hit whatever record low we need to hit to go to phase four, 
If we're not enabling these businesses to prepare now and operate as if they were in phase two, we can set ourselves up again to fail. If Exit Inn has operated as a restaurant and put in plexiglass and operated in phase two standards, shown that it works, I think public perception will increase, as well as if they open in phase four, we have to go back to phase two. We may not put them in the same situation yet again. So I just want everybody in this room to think about that, but also for our committee to continue to keep that in our brains as we look as we move forward. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.org.